Up to this point, we've looked at quite a number of systems using quantum mechanical methods, whether that be Hartree-Fock models, post-Hartree-Fock models, semi-empirical models, density functional models, and yet our focus has tended to be on the ground electronic state. I want to spend the next few lectures looking at excited electronic states. So, we usually write the Schrodinger equation in its sort of simplest time-independent form as h psi equals e psi. But really, we ought to recognize that the Hamiltonian operator has a number of eigenfunctions, each with a characteristic eigenvalue. And so, really, it's more informative to write h psi subscript n equals e sub n psi subscript n, where there may be a, a large number of n. And in fact, if we con consider continuum solutions, that is, cases where you might excite an electron into uh, the continuum by ionizing it from a molecule, there's clearly an infinite number of solutions, although most of those are boring, of course, and an unbound electron. So, Hartree-Fock theory was developed in order to have a way to express a wave function in a properly anti-symmetric way and a simple approach, not the only approach, but a simple approach, and the one we've really looked at within the context of Hartree-Fock theory, is to build it as a Slater determinant, that is, an anti-symmetrized Hartree product of one electron molecular orbitals. And so the question is, if we use that to build a ground state wave function, how might we go on from there in order to construct an excited state wave function, that is, an excited state by reference to the Hartree-Fock ground state? So, we looked at a number of post hartree fock models already. One of them was called configuration interaction. And if you recall, in hartree fock theory, what we do is that we solve the secular equation involving the Fock operator, and the point of that solution is to construct the molecular orbitals, which are expanded in a basis set of atomic-like orbitals, and our goal is to come up with the coefficients, a, for each molecular orbital. And then the Hartree-Fock wave function, the many electron wave function, is the anti-symmetrized product of the occupied molecular orbitals, where we simply occupy orbitals until we run out of electrons, starting at the lowest energy and going up. Now, the Hartree-Fock orbitals themselves aren't perfect because we make an approximation in how the electrons interact with other electrons, the mean field approximation. And indeed, they're not perfect because, really, orbitals are just a convenience that we use in order to solve Hartree-Fock theory. There's nothing that says wave functions really should have one electron orbitals. And so we discussed in the context of improving the ground state to expand the wave function by using a proper Hamiltonian as some coefficient times the Hartree-Fock wave function plus a uh, a linear combination of singly excited configurations, doubly excited configurations, and that's what configuration interaction means, building a wave function out of a linear combination of configurations, which is to say anti-symmetrized products of orbitals where the orbital occupation is different than that found in the Hartree-Fock wave function. And that's what these subscripts and superscripts mean. They mean take an electron out of the originally occupied in the Hartree-Fock wave function orbital i and place it into the originally virtual orbital r. And that's just a different configuration. <clears throat> so I don't want to recapitulate everything that occurred when we talked about correlated methods for the ground state. I'll just remind you I showed you a minimal basis set H2 and showed that if we adopt this approach of constructing a CI wave function as a linear combination of a sigma squared and a sigma star squared, and the sigma sigma star drops out for a variety of reasons, both symmetry and also Brillouin's theorem, but we don't have to worry about that for the moment. But the point of the minimal basis model is that you can really construct the relevant uh, secular equation you can figure out what the matrix elements are for the Hamiltonian interacting with the different wave functions. And the off-diagonal term is quite simple. It's an exchange integral involving the sigma and sigma star molecular orbitals. And then I showed that if you solve this, it's just you know this times this minus this times this. That's a quadratic equation in E. That the solution in E, which is shown here, involves the lowest energy root being pushed down below the Hartree-Fock energy 
and the other root being pushed up beyond what H22 is. But uh, the point I want to make here is to say before we were interested in that lowest energy root. Now we're actually going to be interested in the excited electronic states. What about the energies of those other roots? Those are the energies of excited states. And so recalling that when we do CI, that was a 2 by 2 example for minimal basis set H2, but with a larger CI matrix, so for instance one that includes single excitations, double excitations, triple excitations, it can go on, but I've run out of space to draw on the slide here, uh, you'll get more and more electron correlation from interaction between these configurations. The CI matrix itself is made larger either by considering higher and higher excitations or notice the index of the virtual orbitals here. As we go to a bigger and bigger basis set, there will be more and more possibilities for the virtual orbitals, and that will also make these, these blocks larger, if you will. When you do uh, carry out a full diagonalization of the CI matrix, every single element along the diagonal then corresponds to the energy of a state. So this will be the energy of the ground state, and it gets pushed down below the Hartree-Fock energy because of interaction with these doubly excited states when you do diagonalization. And there will also be terms all along the entire uh, diagonal here. Each one, if you were to order them by energy, first excited state, second excited state, third excited state, and so on. Now, in order uh, to be computationally practical, a common uh, approach is to truncate after, say, only the double excitations. There's a downside to that. We talked about size extensivity. Uh, I don't want to dwell on that. What I really want to look at is an existing model that does see a reasonable amount of use. And that is the so-called CI singles model for excited states, not for the ground state. This is useless for the ground state because by Brillouin's theorem, there is no coupling between this eigenvalue in the CI matrix and anything involving a singly excited state. On the other hand, this is a dense block of the matrix. This is block diagonal, although in kind of a trivial way, which is to say there's one value here and then there's a whole bunch of values here for all the different ways I could excite an electron out of an occupied orbital into a virtual orbital. But, so how many are there, by the way? How many of these excitations are there? Well, there's m times n, where m and n are the number of occupied and virtual orbitals. And there may be a spin symmetry reduction of that, but in any case, that's a good way to think about it. When we diagonalize this block of the matrix, you will get excited state energies corresponding to states above the ground state. And incidentally, the, the matrix that accomplishes the diagonalization, so if you think of multiplying on the left, multiplying on the right in order to diagonalize, that diagonalizing matrix, its columns are the so-called eigenvectors, and they contain the weights of which determinants are going to be used. These are determinants. How do they contribute to the excited state? So were this to originally just be all diagonal, that would be a very simple system. Uh, you know, you'd have a first excited state that was truly a single excitation from maybe orbital 15 to 16. That might be the homo to the lumo. And then the next one might be 15 to 17, and so on. But in fact, in generally, this is not originally a diagonal matrix. There are interactions between these singly excited configurations. And as a result, we diagonalize them, and the character of the excited state is expressed by that eigenvector. So I'll have an example here in a moment that hopefully will make that much more clear. Now, it's worth noting that the CI singles model is it's an uncorrelated model for excited states, right? We have no, no post-CIS treatment, we might say. So we're not including triple excitations, which are sort of doubly excited relative to the singly excited. And as a result, we don't really get dynamical correlation. So really, these excited state wave functions have a quality that's equivalent to a Hartree-Fock quality for a ground state. And that's not necessarily very high, but it certainly can be informative in a qualitative sense. It's a very efficient model. Analytic gradients are worked out for CI singles, so you can do geometry optimization. And in fact, we saw the semi-empirical model, INDO slash S, and if you cast your mind way back to earlier in the semester, remember that the slash S stood for spectroscopy. 
And uh, this is a, a semi-empirical model originally really worked on very heavily by Mike Zerner. And the parameters were adjusted in order to do very well for spectroscopy when employed with a CI singles approach to getting excited state energy. So it was really optimized for the CIS method. And it's, it's quite surprisingly good and wicked fast. And again, I'll, I'll have an example, and actually it's coming right up. So here is an example that hopefully will illustrate uh, some of these concepts. So here we have acrolein, right? It is an unsaturated ketone, so you've got a conjugated pi system. And these are the results, just ripped out of a, a Gaussian calculation, actually, for the CI singles level of theory. And I'm presenting a number of uh, values here. So let's talk about green first. So green is the energy in electron volts of the first and second excited state above the ground state. And so experimentally, you measure this at 3.73 electron volts and 6.41 electron volts. And we could convert that to a wavelength if we wanted to, but for right now, let's, let's actually work in electron volts. Shown in black are the values that derive from a calculation where we optimize the geometry at the Hartree-Fock level with the 631 GD basis set. And then for that optimized geometry, we carry out a CIS calculation. And so what we find, let's actually look at the, the ground state orbitals for a moment. So when the calculation is done, it predicts that the HOMO and LUMO are pi 2 and pi 3 star, respectively. And so this is a pi system with four atoms. So there's an all bonding combination that's pi 1. There's pi 2 that has a node right here. There's pi 3 that'll have nodes across each of these two formally drawn double bonds. And then finally, pi 4, so 3 and 4 are both an net antibonding, has a node here, a node here, a node here. So I think everybody probably saw these in sophomore organic chemistry, extended pi systems. And so at the Hartree-Fock level, the non-bonding orbital on oxygen, so that's a lone pair type orbital on the oxygen atom, is predicted to be lower in energy than the HOMO. And that's a, a little surprising. People who know much about spectroscopy of ketones probably know that the first excited state is usually considered to be an n to pi star excitation. Well, let's see what CIS says. So it says the first excited state is a singlet, and this, this, uh, this calculation is only doing singlets because we're starting from a singlet ground state. There is CS symmetry in this molecule, so it's assigning it to a point group, but let's not worry about that for the moment. It says the first excited state is 4.8437 electron volts. That corresponds to 255.97 nanometers above the ground state. And here's this vector I was telling you about. It prints out the vector as what are the singly excited configurations and their weights that contribute to this excited state. So it says 14 to 16 is the dominant contributor. And so if we look at it, what's 14? It's this n, 15, 16. It's the n to pi star excitation. So the CI singles level, using ab initio theory, is properly getting what, what we know to be true, that the n to pi star is the lower state. And then there's a little bit of character as well from an n to pi 4 star, but it's, it's less of a contributor. The second excited state, on the other hand, which is predicted here to come in at 7.6 electron volts, and that's a very blue photon, is entirely dominated by a single configuration. It's 15 to 16, so that's the homo to lumo. That's a pi to pi star. And so again, anybody who knows something about unsaturated ketones, that's where you expect to find it. This value here of F, that is the oscillator strength for the calculation. So this is within the dipole approximation, and we'll look at this in the next uh, video or two. What do we expect to be the allowedness of this absorption? So a very, very small number is a formally forbidden excitation. And we know that n to pi star has very low uh, uh, absorptivity because it's nearly forbidden. Meanwhile, the pi to pi star has a massive uh, oscillator strength, and it is indeed allowed, so it's very bright. But if we look at the values here, we're off by 1.1 electron volts, so that's around 25 kcals per mole. Uh, and here we're off by 1.2 electron volts, so again, a, a very large error from the CIS level of theory. So we're predicting these to come in considerably to the blue of the actual molecule. Now, in the red, or brown, I guess it is, are the INDO slash S values. So exactly the same calculation. I'm not showing the eigenvectors here, 
but uh, the prediction here is 3.03, .03, so it underpredicts experiment, but by less than uh, the ab initio level overpredicted it. And actually, it's not bad. It's about 6.1 compared to 6.4 for the pi to pi star. And so that's, uh, you know, considering the, the time savings involved, the INDO slash S is done before you can actually uh, hit return almost. The ab initio would take a little bit longer. Um, so we see that INDO slash S does reasonably well. Well, let me go on and just express sort of the, the ultimate possibility within the context of configuration interaction. And we've seen this before, again, in the context of the ground state. That is, we can expand our CI. So rather than doing all excited configurations, which is, of course, full CI, if we consider every electron being possibly excited to every virtual orbital, we could have a window where we just do excitations near the frontier and then fewer excitations as we get further away from the frontier. And if you remember, this was called CAS, Complete Active Space, or RAS, Restricted Active Space, Self-Consistent Field Theory. So we'd have some window at the frontier where maybe we consider all possible electronic occupations of orbitals, and then we might have another window below that we'd only take a certain number of electrons out of, and another window above that's only allowed to have a certain number of electrons in, and then maybe another window even further below that will keep all the electrons there, but we'll let the shapes optimize while we're optimizing this wave function, and another window above where it's all the same but they're empty, and finally maybe some way, way down and way, way up where we don't even mess with the orbital shapes after Hartree-Fock. So that was CAS SCF or RAS SCF. Well, in general, that's MCSCF, and just as with Hartree-Fock theory, we can look at the energies above, that is the eigenvalues, above the ground state eigenvalues. So we would solve a CI equation or a, a perturbation theory equation very similar to what I just showed for a single determinant. So when you do that with second order perturbation theory, that's called CAS-PT2. That's often taken to be the gold standard of excited state calculations. And the number you'll typically see thrown about is that CAS-PT2 ought to get low-lying excited state energies, so that is to say not something that's, you know, 48 states up or a massive Rydberg state or something, but just, you know, first, second, third, maybe fourth excited state, to within about 0 0.2 electron volts. So that's considered quite good for a excited state energy, and CAS-PT2 reasonably routinely with a good basis set and a good active space manages to do that. In addition, uh, you might consider that choosing the space and optimizing the orbitals for a given state can be a little bit unbalanced. Uh, you'll get a different set of orbitals, say, for the first excited state than you will for the second excited state. And actually, that can lead to real complications if the two states are close to one another, because you might be interested in the second excited state, but it lies only a little bit above the first excited state. And so when the self-consistent field is optimizing the orbitals for that second excited state, well, they're not the best orbitals for the first excited state. And so what will happen as you go along is you get what's called root switching. So the second excited state is going down, down, down in energy because you're making the orbitals better for it. Meanwhile, the first excited state is going up, up, up in energy because you're making the orbitals best for the second state. And then all of a sudden, the second state is lower and that means it's not the second state anymore, it's the first state. And so your computer program will be very confused because you told it to make the second state as good as it can be. So it'll switch over and it'll say, oh, I better start working on this new second state. But then as it optimizes the orbitals for that, foof, it's back to the first state. And so what people do is they do something called uh, state averaging, which is you optimize the orbitals for the average of the two state energies. And as a result, you've got something that's not optimal for either, but sort of keeps them in the right order. And so if you see that state averaged uh, energies, that implies that you're using common orbitals for the two different electronic states. All right, well, that finishes uh, what I want to say about configuration interaction type models. In the next video in this series, we will take a look at what dictates the strength of absorptions and we'll also take a look at a density functional analog to CI singles called time-dependent density functional theory.